my mouth in the meditation of each and every one of our hearts here today. Lord, please God, who is our rock and our redeemer. On this Mother's Day, I thought it would be nice and kind of fun to take a look at John's second letter, which is addressed to the chosen lady and her children. What more appropriate day than Mother's Day to study this second letter on uh, to the chosen lady and her children? And I'd like for us to start off our study by reading the opening verses together. Will you read with me off the overhead? The elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. And Claudia, if you don't want to turn around and be able to read through the rest of this uh, book, the entire book, which is 13 verses long, don't worry, we won't be here till Monday morning, uh, but you guys can turn in your uh, few Bibles. Uh, if you'd rather follow those, this is the New Revised Trans Translation. In his introduction, John refers to himself as the elder. He uses this term because, first of all, he is old and wise and renowned and respected. He doesn't even need to refer to himself by name. As we read that in Paul's letters, we see Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, John was also an apostle of Jesus Christ, one of his inner circle. In fact, at this point, he is the last living apostle of Jesus Christ, the only one who walked within those three years, and yet he refers to him simply as the elder, the pastor of this church. He is known so well that he doesn't even use, need to use his name. But how about this lady? Who is this chosen lady, this elect lady? Everybody knows who John is, but who is she and who are her children? See, John is using a title here, a very specific title, when he refers to her as a lady. He is using the term that is a feminine counterpart to Lord, as in lords and ladies. This is not a term as we use it today. We tend to use it as female adult, ladies and gentlemen. But really it has a very specific term in the Bible here, and it refers to a lord's lady, a woman of nobility, of stature, of gentry, perhaps even of nobility. So who would John know who was a noble woman, a queen or a princess? Who is it that John would know? The chances are likely he didn't know any queens or princesses, that he didn't walk in those circles. And so probably John is using this uh, honorific title in reference to a local church, a local congregation, and he is calling her the chosen lady. And if she's a lady, who is her Lord? God. The Lord God is her Lord. And He chose her. And if she is the lady, if the church is the lady, and the Lord God is God, who are the children? Yeah, Christians, children, the children of God, believers, the members of the church. And so when, we, when John refers to the chosen lady, he's referring to probably a local congregation, a specific congregation, although by extension all the church, um, but he's referring to a local congregation and its members. So John is writing to a local church. In the opening lines, he makes two things fairly clear. He speaks with great tender, uh, great tenderness and love when he's expressing his care for this lady. He reveals, first he expresses care, and secondly he reveals the theme of his letter. And it's a twofold theme. He reveals that his book is going to be talking about love and talking about truth. Look at how many times the word truth appear. In just two verses we see it three times. The love right there. John is going to reaffirm uh, this. He's going to drive this point home in the next verse as he gives his greetings as he gives his blessing, his opening blessing. Let's read that together in verse 3, and you'll see at the end there how he reaffirms this theme. Ready? Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. Truth and love. Truth and love are the themes of this letter. 
He's even worked it in to the opening, into his greeting, and into the opening blessing. And he starts his letter on a very positive and upbeat note. He starts by celebrating the fact that some of this chosen lady's children, some of these children of this chosen lady, the members, the church members, are following in Christ's footsteps. They are committed to the church doctrine, to the right church doctrine. And listen as we read it together in verse 4. I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we have been commanded by the Father. What does it mean that the children, the members of the church, were walking in the truth? Well, it means two things. It means, one, that they believed the right doctrine. They were believing what was true, but that they were also living that belief out in their lifestyles. They were walking their life, their choices, their lifestyles in the truth, the, the biblical truth, the right doctrine of the church. They were uh, practicing what's called orthopraxy, right practice, right practice of life, and orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is right belief. So they had right practice and they had right belief. They were walking in the truth. Then John turns from this opening greeting, this opening blessing, and this commendation into his first command of the letter. And really, this is probably the main point of this, of this book. And one of the main purposes of this letter is to get this command out on the floor so that everybody can see it, everybody hears it. So we should be paying attention as we read it together in verses 5 and 6. Join with me. But now, dear lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but one we have had from the beginning. Let us love one another, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning. You must walk in it. John's command is simple enough. Love each other. That's it. Love each other one another. And how do we do that? John defines love as obedience to God's commandments. To love is to obey. If we live our lives according to God's commandments, then we are loving. And if we don't, then we are not. See, God's commands are designed to train us to love both him and one another. So when we disobey God's commands, it is an act of defiance against God, an act of hatred toward God. Disobedience is hatred toward God. But also because of the practicality of it, because he designed them to teach us love for one another, disobeying God's commandments are also hatred toward one another. So to love God and to love each other is tantamount to obeying God. If we obey God, we will love both Him and one another. Obedience brings love. Obedience to Him who is love brings love into our souls, teaches us love, <coughs> nurtures love within us. But that's not what some people were teaching during John's time. That's not what some people were telling the people at this church to whom he's addressed this letter. They were not teaching the truth. They were teaching something that was false. They were denying the nature of Jesus. They were saying that Jesus hadn't really come physically, that he had only come as a spirit. They were denying this doctrine of the church, that Jesus, God's Son, God in the flesh, had come, had been incarnated, had lived here as a person, flesh and blood among us, and they were denying this truth. John gives a strong warning to people who disregard, disobey, or uh, deny the truth of God's word. Listen to this strong warning and let's read it together in verses 7 and 8. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. 
Be on your guard so that you do not lose what you have worked for, but may receive a full reward. He says that if you listen to such people, if you listen to such liars, if you, uh, if you agree with them, then you are in danger of losing some or all of your reward. He encourages and commands church members to stand firm on the truth of the Bible and not to fall for the deceptive teachings of those in their midst. Those who claim to be, to be teaching good things, those who claim to be teaching Christian things, those who claim to be teaching true things, but who are really denying what the Bible taught and what the Bible teaches. They were denying the scripture and they were denying Christ. These people, John has a name for them. John gives them a title. He calls them anti-Christs. People who deny the Bible, people who deny God's teaching and espouse another teaching, people who don't believe what the Bible teaches and conduct their lives in such a way as to deny the truths of the Bible are, as John says, anti-Christs. They are against Christ. They are living and actively working against Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are antichrists. This is what John calls them in his day. But friends, they didn't die out with John's generation. We have many people like this alive and well today. People who claim to be teaching something that is good, but something that contradicts the Bible. People who deny the Bible, either in doctrine or practice, deny Jesus Christ. They deny the truths of the Bible, and if they teach others to do this, they are condemned by John as antichrists. If people teach, talk, converse, and deny the Bible in their conversations, they are what John says are antichrists. Just for example, there are many people alive and well today who teach that all we need to do to get to heaven is live pretty good lives. We need to be pretty good. Why are you going to heaven? I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty good guy. I never killed anybody. I'm great. <laughs> yeah, that puts me in a great statue. I, I live a pretty good I try to be good. I try to do what's right. Friends, people who teach this are teaching something that is anti-Christ, that is anti-Bible. People that teach you get to heaven by living a good life are teaching something that goes direct, it directly contradicts what the Bible says we need to do to go to heaven, which is what? Have faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you get to heaven. People who teach that you need to live a good life to get to heaven are teaching something that is anti-Christ, anti-Christian, against Christ. There are other people who say that all ways to God are equally valid, all paths lead to heaven. All religions are basically the same, just expressed to different cultures from a different background. They're basically equally valid and basically equally true. This denies the clear teaching of Scripture, which is again and again that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way, the only truth, and the only life for anyone who must live. People who teach this, that all paths are basically equal, are denying and attacking Jesus Christ. They are anti-Christs. So these are people that deny the truth, but there are also people who deny the walk, who walk backwards, walk away, run away, and teach others to run away. They, they not only teach doctrinally, but they teach practice, that people not practice what the Bible teaches. There are people out there who teach that it's okay to take a life at any time, especially before they're born. But life is sacred. It is sacred. Now there are times when God calls us to do it, but each and every life is sacred. People say that it's not sacred until it's born, or not sacred until its heart beats. But friends, all humanity is formed in the image of God, made in the fashion of their maker. From the moment they are a zygote in their mother's womb, or an embryo, or a fetus, infants, children, adolescents, adults, and yes, friends, even senior citizens are made in the image of God. Aren't you glad to hear that? Even people, from the moment they are a single-cell organism, 
until they are 